Hello, friends. This is Mike Williams. Today, I am joined by my colleagues Sally, Vicky, and Ofer as we discuss and share our thoughts on the new information contained in the updated edition of the Memoirs of Billy Shears. And so, without further ado, here's the show, and thanks for listening. We talked a little bit about Philip Norman's book. Peter Brown's got a book. There have been a lot of books written. They've all got books. Yeah. Have you read any of them? I burned a couple. <laughs> All right, to set the record straight, are you ever going to put it down? Um, I don't know, really. Uh, it's just never really occurred to me until recently when I start to realize that I'm going to forget it soon. You know, because 20 years is not a long, you know, it's, it's uh, not easy to remember all the facts. So I suppose, you know, there's, I might in the next couple of years just put it down just to remember it all more than anything. I haven't got any desire to really be a autobiographical novelist. Right? But you'd like to set the record straight. Well, I would like to set the record straight. I'd like to put down my version in some way, yeah. Well, folks, we have a great show. It's another roundtable, and we're going to discuss the 2021 version of the Memoirs of Billy Shears, which has been updated with a bunch of new information, especially when we take a look at the footnotes. And our guests today are Ofer, Vicky, and Sally. And Ofer is new to the roundtable, so I'm Really happy that Ofer agreed to join us. And we're going to talk about what's new in the updated version of the book. There is a lot of new information. It gets a lot more into the more esoteric aspects of, of the conspiracy. And so we will have a discussion and share our thoughts and insights. What I'd like to do is just to go around the table a little bit and ask each one of our guests to talk about and give us a rundown on how they got involved in the whole Beatles and McCartney conspiracy. And over since you are joining us for the first time, why don't you give us a uh, an understanding of how you got into the whole conspiracy? Hi, um, and Mark, thanks again for having me on your show. Um, I grew up on the rumor in the 70s, and for 40-some years just thought, like everyone else, that this is one big joke. Then I stumbled upon your uh, December 2018 presentation. I immediately ordered the uh, uh, Tom's book, and I read it in early 2019, and that got me started, basically. Okay, all right. Vicky, how did you get started? I uh, have always loved mysteries, always loved mysteries. And I was just looking around at one point for something to watch video wise one evening. And I ran across the last testament of George Harrison. Now, I know that's not the best one, but there was enough pictures, enough things in there that made me want to look a little closer to read more about it or dismiss it one or the other. Cause I couldn't, it, it was enough that you couldn't dismiss. So I, uh, I bought the book. I bought the book and I was immediately hooked. I watched uh, some of your videos early on, and that's probably how I got hooked up with the book. But I did. Once I read the book, I, I was hooked, and I've been with it ever since. That's probably 2016 or so. Okay. Well, The Last Testament of George Harrison, that's not George Harrison, by the way, but it is filled up with little little clues, like everything else with this conspiracy. So uh, there are fictional aspects of it. Yes, but there are other little bits and pieces of information in that documentary. I actually have the DVD, so uh, I, I wouldn't throw that documentary out. Some people just say, oh, you know, it's all false. And But uh, there are there are chunks of that documentary which will set you on the course to go take a look into this conspiracy. Sally, how did you get involved? Uh, same thing. Watched Watched that with my daughter, as a matter of fact, and... Throughout the whole thing, we both just kept looking at each other going, wow, is this creepy or what? And uh, it was just enough in it to entice you to go looking further. In fact, my daughter, who had uh, knew I was a big Beatles fan, had bought me a bunch of postcards. And she went and bought and grabbed those postcards off the bookshelf and brought them back to me. And there was one with Paul holding a question mark and all this different stuff. And we were just looking at these uh, these postcards and going, oh, my gosh, it's right there. Then uh, I just went digging further, found you, found the book. I guess the rest is history. 
Yeah, in fact, uh, another documentary which is great is The Winged Beetle. And uh, I found a link to the documentary. It's, it's not easy to find these days. And it was on archive.org. And it's available to the public. And so I posted it on my blog. And uh, I sent it to everyone here in case you wanted to get a refresher. I, I found that documentary, The Winged Beetle, to be excellent as well. It's, a, it's another piece of footage or video that begs you to ask questions and to go digging. And I guess what I'll do is I will put that link down below in the description box of this show in case anybody is interested. I did post it on my community page on my YouTube channel, you know, and a lot of people go there, but not, you know, not all of my subscribers. So I'll drop it down below for anybody who's interested in watching the winged beetle. Okay. So let's start with the first question and I'll ask, Sally, this question first. Do you sense, Sally, more people are becoming aware of the conspiracy? I, I know we've asked this before, and the answer has been yes. But do you think it has increased since our last roundtable, which was, I guess, about a year ago or so, or is it just kind of hanging static? Uh, well, I, I think it's just going to continue to increase. Uh, it's not going to... It's not going to go backwards, that's for sure. Um, the genie is out of the bottle. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's increasing. I mean, I watched a, um, a video earlier of, uh, it's called Paul McCartney's uh, Funniest Moments. And uh, there are several references to the Paul is dead. Uh, why did they include that in there? Right. If if they weren't trying to get the message out. And I have found that people are, are accepting it now are to the point where they just don't really care. But that's the way it is with conspiracies anyway. I mean, it, when the whole jabby thing started, you know, those of us were going, this is not right. This is, you know, this is what's going on. And they didn't want to believe at the beginning. And then all of a sudden they're resolved to, yeah, but that's the way it is. And they move on. Yeah, I, I think what happens is, once you know it, you know it, and then it becomes frustrating when you try to get other people to wake up to whatever conspiracy it is, and you find that there's a lot of pushback, there's a lot of apathy, and so what winds up happening is you kind of sit with it yourself. In other words, what winds up being important is that you know, and uh, people are on their own path, their own rate and pace to figure things out, and as I've said in so many shows and interviews, some people will never figure it out. They will go to their graves completely embracing the matrix, uh, regardless of what topic we're talking about, whether it be the Beatles or something else, you know. So uh, let me switch over to uh, to Vicky. Vicky, do you find a higher level of awareness or is it just kind of stagnant? I thought that it was a little I mean, it's still increasing, but it's a very slow increase, almost leaning towards stagnant a little bit. I have a hard time with people that grew up with the Beatles, listening them and seeing them, convincing them, because they can't rearrange their mind to think that it might have been something else that they knew all along. They they just can't undo uh, or they're not willing to undo it. But I, I do want to say, if you jump on this conspiracy and learn it and learn all of the different things about it, it really is every other conspiracy is kind of like it. Right. You know, the whole cabal thing and, and everything like that. So um, I think people can get there wherever there is uh, awake a variety of ways, but I'm glad I chose this one to do it because this this conspiracy really is great. I wish more people would pay attention, but I think if it became too popular, they'd pull the plug on the info they let out, and I don't want to see that either. Yeah, it contains all of the ingredients of a psychological operation and a conspiracy. There's no question about it. And once you get into this and you learn about the different parts and the components – you can apply it to any PSYOP or conspiracy that's out there. In fact, you can apply it to what's currently going on today, current events-wise, right? I can't say what that is, otherwise YouTube will pull the video, but you guys know what I'm talking about. Ofer, do you find an awareness? You wrote a book, and before we got started, you said 
it's been difficult trying to get people to turn the corner and even pay attention. I think that uh, the barrier to entry is still quite high. I mean, people cannot believe that somebody or a group of people managed to pull all of this off. Few people relatively uh, waking up to it, but I don't think it's in large amounts. I mean, something major must happen for them to to realize and then to go back and read the books and, and everything. But it's very difficult to, to open the mind and, and to think that such a thing could be pulled off. Yeah. With the Beatles of all people and places. Well, what I have found, just to share my thoughts, is that the deeper aspects of the conspiracy, uh, a lot of people have difficulty getting their arms wrapped around that. So when we talk about the esoteric, we talk about Crowley, we talk about the magic, we talk about, even when we talk about the deep state, a lot of people just, for whatever reason, don't go there. What I have found is a lot of people like to, they like to play around on the veneer of the conspiracy. And I don't know whether that's because they feel comfortable there, maybe they feel like it's a safe place to be, because if they go any deeper into it, it does get dark. And I can see where it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. What do you think about that, Alfred? Do you think that that is a piece of it or no? There's a chain of um, fact, factual things in this conspiracy that even if you pass the, the first, the very basic thing of, hey, these are two different people, take a look. I mean, it's that obvious. But then you begin to, to question everything around it, and everything is more crazier to the average person, and they, they lose you at one point or another, you know? So we have a tough job. Well, we'll just keep plugging along, putting information out, and sharing our research. That's really all we can do. But let me ask the next question, and Sally, I'll ask you first, what is your overall opinion of the 2020? one version of the book, the, the new version, which came out last September. What are your thoughts when you were reading that book? It's It's got more information than the previous version, and as I mentioned to my audience, it's gotten darker. Well, it, it confirmed a lot of things that I started suspecting the third time around reading it. There's more at play here in terms of um, ancient gods than the first, uh, the first versions uh, wanted to allude to. So when I came across um, where they speak a lot about Osiris and Horus, and it became very clear what's going on, where they're going with this, new versions will, will obviously confirm and go even darker than what it was. See, that's, that's a good point that you're on, because I think that that's where a lot of people just kind of throw their hands up. Because when you get to those parts of the book, when they start talking about the... Egyptian mysteries and going back to Egypt, Isis, Osiris, Horus, Set, a lot of people just can't understand that stuff. And one of the main reasons is because, not that they can't understand it, it takes a lot of work and research to understand Egyptian mythology. And by the way, folks, when I say mythology, right, there's also a misconception that mythology means that something is not real, that it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that that's not the case at all. And it's everywhere. Yes. Uh, if you're paying attention, all of these entertainers are constantly covering one eye. They're constantly giving hand signals, alluding to all of that if you just pay attention to what they're doing. Right, right. So the Egyptian motif, the symbolism is all around us without a question of a doubt. So there is definitely something to it. And I know, uh, Sally, you did a lot of work. We won't get into it in this show, folks. Sally and I are going to do a separate show where she did some amazing research into Pan. And uh, we will talk about that because that could be, well, it will be a whole show by itself and we won't be able to cover it here. But uh, there's a whole lot to this. And Vicki, what, what were your thoughts about the 2021 version of the book? Uh, I thought I had great footnotes. Um, obviously, when you get a new version of this, you're tempted to just open it up and read the footnotes. And I probably did do that. But I, I did that, uh, too. <laughs> but I did go back and reread, you know, most of the a lot yeah. of the text. But 
It is shorter. It's been compressed a little bit. And I think it is darker, but I think it might be if someone is not willing to go back and read all the books, it might be an alternative just because it's a little shorter. It's a little easier to convince someone to read, you know, what is it, 400 pages versus 666. Billy's back, you're talking about? Yeah, Billy's back. Right. It's it's a little bit condensed, so that does help. It does get darker, but there's just so much to it. I think it's interesting, though, because they don't um, they they continue to republish the book. And then when we're not getting something, they're pointing it out. It's almost like a teacher's edition or something. You know what I mean? Every every time we don't get something, the next version kind of urges, uh, encourages us to read about this or or that 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 we need to know. Uh, That's something I've noticed. Yeah, I, I think that that's Tom pulsing what he's seeing as far as questions that people are asking or questions that people are not asking. So in order to move the disclosure forward, and I'm going to ask a question a little later. Please remind me if I forget about whether full disclosure will ever happen. And this goes back to the whole Osiris Horus ritual that's being played out between biological Paul and Billy, as we're told in the book. But let me just leave that there for now so I don't convolute the discussion all for your views on the 2021 version of the book. Well, I think that the, the big reveal is at the center, and we'll talk about it later, uh, referring to the uh, deep state uh, being responsible for uh, Paul's disappearance. But also there the, are the, the, a lot of uh, other uh, pieces of information which aligns with your work and with things that we that we that you discussed in your other shows. Um, I do like to point out that there is still more than meets the eye. And I think that there is more encoding in this version, which we have yet to figure out. And I'll give you one example. On chapter 44, the, uh, the footnote on page four, 406, it says that Sir William Wallace is the code to identify William's biological father, whose name is yet another code. That's the quote. So obviously there is more information. I, I've, I've been going over this chapter several times and I'm, I couldn't figure it out. So I believe that there's still a lot more inside the pages than that we, we are aware of. So that's one thing. But the, uh, the bottom line for me, uh, reading this version of memoirs is that there's no other book like this. The way it was written with the encoding and the fact that we are given great disclosure about the biggest group and the biggest musician in music's history, and lots of understanding of how the world works, it makes it a very important book in my mind. And all of, uh, lots of uh, the inf- uh, information is stuff that we we can't get anywhere else. So this makes it makes it a very important document. Okay, I I agree with that, Ofer. There's a lot of insights that this book is offering into how the world really works. And it has the ability, or I should say the advantage, because it's talking about a topic that a lot of people are familiar with, the Beatles, Paul McCartney, and so on. The book is, in my opinion, leveraging the Beatles, leveraging Paul McCartney and and the replacement and death of Paul McCartney to introduce this other information about how the world really operates. So I agree with your assessment. Remember the part where it said you can do a simple Google search for my father or something like that. So instead of continuing to search for is Bill related to Aleister Crowley and is Bill related to William Wallace, because we already know that. I think I searched something like Crowley and the Hardy Warrior. Yes. And Crowley means the Hardy Warrior. And yes, there is a lineage if you research that. So it's saying that Aleister Crowley is appears to be or is reported as a in the lineage of William Wallace. So that does make them related somehow. But, you know, they could be 26 cousins from that statement. But if you search it that way, yes, it does say that. Right. So this is something that we have been talking about. Right. So some people want to know, is Crowley Billy's biological father and When you read memoirs, I believe it strongly alludes to the fact that Crowley is his biological 
father. But at the very least, and this is what I've said, Vicki, in other shows, if Alistair is not Billy's biological father, then he is certainly bloodline related. And that's the best way I can explain it, because there's no way to be definitive about this, because the book is not directly making a connection. It's like I said, it, the book is like a big puzzle, folks. And it drops clues, and it leaves it to the intrepid reader, researcher, to look things up outside the book. This is how the book works. This is why when some people talk about, oh, the book is historical fiction and yada yada and all that stuff, what they don't realize, even though I've explained it many, many times, is the book is layered. So there's three layers. The first layer is you read the book at face value. The second layer is you read the bolded words on each page. That gives you more information. And then there's the acrostical code. That's the third layer. And even within the first layer of the book, when you read it, there are sections and narratives that point you to go outside the book to research, to gather more information. And before we started the call, I had mentioned that this is how I ended up looking into and researching whether the Beatles wrote all their own music. It was based upon some of the wording and clues that were dropped on page 350 and page 351. And I believe it was the original 2009 version of the book, the red covered book, that led me to, to go outside the book and to do the research. Now, the third question. This is a very important one. For the first time in this edition of Memoirs, we learned that biological Paul was murdered. So the whole car accident bit has kind of been taken off the table. That's how I read it. And so we're getting a darker piece of what could possibly have happened. So, Sally, what are your thoughts on that aspect of the book where it seems like the, the whole car crash thing is gone by the wayside? Yeah, I suspected right from the start that he had been murdered and that uh, that it wasn't just a, a car accident. What's really interesting is uh, the Strawberry Fields video. They show the car going through his head. And with the, the song about Maxwell Silver's hammer, it kind of gives me the impression that that's, that's how he was taken out. They used that hammer on his head. And they even show three times in the back of the head and then two times in the front of the head, which is uh, really interesting. How, how they did that, and that's in the um, Wing Beatles video. You know, I suspected right along that that he was uh, he was murdered. And the book tells us that these ritual sacrifices are set up or camouflaged to look like accidents. This is why, whenever I was asked the question on shows where I was being interviewed, I would say the prevailing theory is a car crash or a car accident. In fact, going back to my presentation, The Beatles, Paul McCartney, and The Grand Illusion, which goes back to 2018, I actually presented uh, a slide or two that had to do where there was a car accident, but that the deep state was there on site. In other words, they forced the car accident, and they were there to make sure that if the car crash itself did not kill them, they made sure the deep state operatives, that Paul died, that he was taken out. So, Vicki, what are your thoughts on that piece of the book? I've always had trouble with the car wreck issue, although I know that that's the narrative. That's what they always say. That's just, it's Paul McCartney died in a car wreck in 1966. They always say that. But I, always, I have problems with it because in the book it says clearly that um, – Paul's parents, meaning dad and stepmom, viewed the body and said that couldn't be Paul. Those aren't his clothes. And he loaned his car out. And Brian Epstein didn't think it was either. But then it just the next paragraph, it just continues on where they're just replacing them. Just, oh, well, we must replace them. We must hurry and get this done. And so. I always had a problem with that. I'm not saying there wasn't a car wreck and there wasn't. I, I just thought it was a double in it. And if this person, if Paul McCartney is so important that they name a religion after him, it just seemed like they would have something more special in mind than an accident, an accidental car wreck or something. So, you know, no, this is supposed to be the top of their religion. So 
they have something else more important figured out for a ritual, I guessed. And um, so I always had trouble with with the car wreck issue, although I'm not going to dismiss that there wasn't one, uh, because if they had to backtrack and say, you know, if, if they got caught somehow, that's a nice way to say that he died in some acceptable manner. Right. So I agree with you that there is a ceremonial ritual aspect to his death because it does have to tie back to what their philosophy and their tenets are of their religious beliefs. And I'm talking about the religious beliefs of those that are involved from a deep state perspective as it ties back to Egyptian lore. If you want to know how he really died, that's exactly where you should look, is Egyptian lore. It's going to be something more that happened in one of those stories, I would think. I would agree with that. Ofer, what are your thoughts about the uh, the car crash? Because I remember you writing me going back about two weeks ago and saying, Mike, <laughs> the car crash is off the table. What's going on here? Yeah, um, I still have some difficulty reasoning with this, the, the entire car accident story all of a sudden uh, disappearing. And let me just explain. Uh, throughout the new uh, version of the book, the chunk of information about the car accident remains. The details of the meeting that night, the story about Paul storming out, picking up Donna, then the car crash, then the book continues with the repair of the wrecked, wrecked car, and lots and lots of clues in the songs. So this was the narrative we received in the previous editions, and most of it remains. Now, what happened is that we have this uh, footnote on page uh, 200, and I think there are a couple of other places where it says that uh, Paul was already dead at 5 in the morning, right? which contradicts the uh, car accident story. This, this is what, what, we, what we get. So I'm questioning what are, what are we supposed to believe right now? Which version is true? And if the car accident is off the table, why do we still have it in the book? And what happened to all the clues? I mean, Wednesday morning at 5 o'clock, well, maybe this clue changed to <laughs> stand behind the new information of Paul being dead at 5 in the morning. I was going to say, that's from uh, She's Leaving Home. So they talk about 5 o'clock in the morning. But, uh, you know, the, the famous lines, he blew his mind out in a car, or you were in a, in a car crash and you lost your hair, and the song Death Cab for Cutie yep. at the end of Magical Mystery Tour, which is basically the whole story of the accident. So what are we supposed to, to believe right now? Now, I did find one very interesting uh, change in the actual um, text not in the footnotes, between the, uh, this new version, the uh, 2018 version. In the chapter, You Want Dates, I compared the top paragraph on page 156 in Memoirs 2018 to the same but new paragraph at the bottom of page 157. And I found a completely new paragraph. It seems Tom completely deleted the report from the truck driver who witnessed the supposed car crash, and he replaced it with a paragraph, and you will find it easily, uh, where it says, uh, we cannot say, stories were made up, etc. So this was actually, uh, so the truck driver piece of it is gone. I, I did a comparison because I, I was, I was waiting for the, I remember the, the, the testimony by the car, by the uh, truck driver. And in this new version, it was gone. So I, I already, you know, I, I did a comparison and, and I, it's really gone. So, um, but most of the general text in memoirs, with, um, the new version remained intact. So this was, uh, rather, uh, strange to me. And, but I have to agree that they're probably moving away from the car crash story and into the murder of Bioport at 5 a.m. and, to end this, uh, I will quote another one sentence from a footnote on page 301. Uh, Billy's double narrative. It says, occasional false clues set up a straw man to be blown down to discredit the real intel. So this is something that should always be on the back of our minds. 
in terms of um, the changing narratives. But uh, this is why I was also waiting to, to hear your opinion about uh, about this. And uh, we seem to agree that uh, the deep state uh, version is kind of catching up. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing, Ofer and Sally and Vicky, is that taking the car crash off the table also does something else. So we had that whole scenario where the way the car crash happened was Paul, biological Paul, was supposedly in the studio and he got song assignments from Brian Epstein and he didn't like the number of songs that he received in the time frame that he had to put them together or write them and all that stuff. And everybody knows <laughs> where, where, I'm, where I'm at as far as I'm actually writing their music, but I'm just giving you the narrative. And so the prevailing theory is or the story is that biological Paul received these songwriting assignments and then he left the studio when a huff got in his car. It was raining and then there was a car crash. But what that says now, because the book took the car crash out of the out of the discussion, is that that whole scene where he was being given song assignments by Brian Epstein, that's also off the table. Because the book is telling us now that whatever happened took place in the very early hours of the morning. So it wasn't in the evening. It wasn't the original story had it pushing close to midnight, if I recall correctly. It was very late at night. Yes. And now that's not the discussion anymore. Now it's, hey, his death took place very early in the morning on September 11th of 1966. There is a movie out there, and it's about where Paul dies, and he they chase him, and he's in the car. And have you not seen that? Maybe it's the Walrus. It's the Walrus. Yeah, in the Walrus movie, Paul, um, it, it was sort of a car wreck. He kind of ran the road, the the car off the road, but they actually hunted him down, which is one of the things, the ways the Cabal supposedly does this. They have hunting parties, like in Hunger Games. And um, anyway, in this movie, they actually he gets out of the car and he's trying to run away. And it's about five o'clock in the morning early. You can it's dusk sort of you can see the sun starting to come up. I mean, twilight. They hunt him down and they kill him. And so, you know, some of those movies that they put out are spot on. It has a lot of things in it. If you watch it, it's not a long movie either. I have a link to that movie. And folks, I will put the link to the Walrus movie down in the description box below so you can take a look at it. You can decide for yourself. Sally, how about yourself? Yeah, like I said, um, I suspected that he was murdered all along. But just to a little sideline, if anybody's paying attention to the whole Bob Saget thing, we're seeing the whole thing play out right before our eyes. I mean, he died in his sleep real early in the morning. Then they couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. People suspected that he had had um, a certain procedure that we can't talk about. And now the autopsy is showing that he had several very massive blows to the back of his head and the, the front of his head. This could be just uh, one of the many ways that the deep state take people out. That's interesting. I hadn't heard that, that uh, they believe that maybe he was assaulted. Oh, yeah. He's, he had major uh, blows to the back of his head, and uh, the autopsy showed uh, uh, both eye sockets were, were bruised. Like, like we've said, once you start getting into this and you understand how the deep state and these organizations operate, some of the stuff is going to sound really crazy and wacky to a lot of people, but, uh, you know, they have very strange ways of taking care of business. You know, and like we've said, Vicky was saying, they tell us about this stuff. They, they depict it in movies and in, in films and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, we just think, okay, well, it's just, you know, it's just a James Bond movie or whatever. But there's a lot of embedded truth in what they show us. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, let's just drop down now to um, talking about on page 15. This is the first time I saw this clue, and it was talking about Maxwell Knight who was a British spy master. And I did a very short video on this, and I'll drop the link to that down below too in case folks hadn't watched it. So the way I read that footnote is that Maxwell Knight, being part of the deep state in intelligence, being a spy master, was 
directly involved or maybe if not directly involved from the standpoint of physically taking part in whatever went down was perhaps maybe overseeing what took place with regard to Paul McCartney's death. And of course, we have the song Maxwell's Silver Hammer. And Sally, we'll go back to you because you mentioned the hammer before. So isn't that kind of interesting that we have Maxwell's Silver Hammer and then on page 15 of Memoirs, in the bolded out words, we get the clue about Maxwell Knight. And we also have a, a, a very prominent case of Ghislaine Maxwell being involved in the deep state, her father being involved in the deep state. Right. All of these things seem to be uh, coming full circle. Yeah, well, like I said, it's it's real. It exists. It's just a matter of people looking into it. And some folks won't look into it because, honestly, it, it gets dark. It gets very uncomfortable. And a lot of people don't have the... Um, the ability. They don't have the desire to to want to dig into those areas because it is uncomfortable. They'd rather watch TV or, or a sports game. or Exactly. Bread and circuses. Vicki, how about yourself? What did you think about that, the Maxwell Night Club? Well, first of all, I want to say that everybody else went downstairs and watched the Super Bowl the other night, except for me, and I stayed and reread Billy's back. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're so um, devoted. <laughs> I think his age at the time would have been difficult for him to actually be the hatchet man. But I'll go along with he supervised it. This is all supposed to be about, you know, out with the old and with the new, right? That's that's what they do. So I would not be surprised at all if he supervised it. He was the, the Bond character. James Bond character was based off of him, supposedly, right? Right. And we do have Bill playing a uh, Bond song, Live and Let Die. Very good. That's a very good connection. <laughs> yeah. But there was also a movie called Thunderball that was set in the Bahamas, kind of like Help, but I haven't, I didn't get, you know, I didn't go there yet with that to see if there was anything else in um, common. Although I would love to know, I would really love to know what at the end of the movie Help, the sewing machine, the singer means. Have you seen that? It says the singer or singer. No. The ending of Help, they zero in on this kind of a beach scene, but it has like an old-fashioned antique sewing machine that says singer there, and maybe that's supposed to be Paul. He was a singer. I don't know, but I'd love to know what what that clue means someday. I'd like to finally figure that out. Anyway, back to – I'm sorry, back to Maxwell Knight. Uh, yeah, I think that he, uh, this was him in charge of it, or at least his playbook of the disposal of biological Paul McCartney. The murder and disposal of him was up to, uh, a spy. Yeah, British intelligence. British intelligence, simple as that. Yep. Ofer, what are your thoughts? Well, apparently the deep state was involved, and only three years after another act, of a famous American president, and apparently one of the most famous and successful people in the world was taken out. I said before that uh, there's a lot more that we still don't don't see in this version of memoirs, and this is an excellent example because the same words were in the 2018 edition, and what Tom did now is he boiled it out, and you picked up on it, and all of a sudden the words of the song, Maxwell Silver, Silver Hammer, get a new meaning. And this song was never on my radar for clues. Made sure that he was dead. Okay, but the rest of the lyrics didn't make any sense to me. So apparently the water well of clues has yet to be dried up, and who knows what more is awaiting us. And by the way, Maxwell Silver Hammer is a very uh, childish kind of song, it was issued actually as a single on several territories. I don't think in, in the U.S. or the U.K., but it did uh, play on the radio uh, also here. But who would have thought <laughs> there would be a connection? It's a very weird song. Yeah, and weird lyrics. And all of a sudden it gets a new meaning. Yeah, and, and John Lennon has said he always hated that song, by the way. <laughs> he said that uh, the recording of that song went on forever. And he was completely disgusted by the time, I guess, they got to the end. 
Now let's talk a little bit about the footnote on page 17, which I thought was very interesting. So before I, I read the question, I have mentioned on a couple of shows that, that it's possible that the Beatles, in particular, uh, biological Paul McCartney and John Lennon, and of course we can include George Harrison and, and Ringo as well, but I usually focus on the two main characters, which would be McCartney and Lennon, that it was possible that they were in mind control programs going back to when they were kids. And I touched on this a bit in my big presentation, did the Beatles write all their own music toward the end? So then the footnote on page 17 in the new memoirs gets very interesting, and it tells us the song Yesterday was a result of a hypnosis session with Richard and Margaret Asher, which is Jane Asher's parents, and George Martin encouraged Paul's relationship with Jane, and this strongly alludes to Paul not writing the song yesterday, as well as telling us he was in a mind control program. And that was my takeaway from reading that footnote on page 17. So, Vicki, what did you think when you read that footnote? Well, this is one of the topics we have kind of mulled over for a while. Um, him living there and um, the whole the whole thing is kind of crazy, really. You have a psychiatrist, a uh, very renowned one, everyone knows. And then you have the mother, who was George Martin's music teacher. And I wouldn't be surprised if she weren't somehow Bill's music tutor or teacher also. Living in a home with them for an extended period of time with their young their young daughter, who was much younger than him, that whole thing didn't make a lot of sense to me, the whole setup, until you kind of put this into the equation that dad was doing experiments on Paul just to see about mind control. Um, I did kind of look a little deeper into some of that, and uh, I'll just kind of read you what I, what I found here. Jane's father, Dr. Richard Asher, was a pioneer in hypnotic techniques and had written several articles for Lancet on the subject. Jane's mother was a professor of music and had taught George Martin, usually known as the Fifth Beatle. Jane played Alice in Through the Looking Glass. There's another character, which was produced by Jonathan Miller, one of Dr. Richard Asher's students. Another of Dr. Asher's students was Oliver Sacks, the author of Musicology, The Science of Music and the Brain. He also wrote Awakenings, which was made into a film starring Robin Williams. Dr. Asher's practice was less than 100 yards from the practice of Dr. Stephen Ward, the same Dr. Stephen Ward in the, how do you say, a Profumo affair? Yes. Both Dr. Stephen Ward and Dr. Richard Asher committed suicide. Richard Asher was found hanged in the same room that Paul composed that was Eleanor Rigby. Not sure about that. I thought they found him in the basement. but I thought they found him in the basement, too, and it, it, after five days. So nobody checked the basement. <laughs> nobody checked the basement. Uh, Jane and Paul were engaged in December of 67. Paul married Linda in March of 69, and Jane's father was found dead in April of 69. I don't know what the correlation is there, but I think there's something. The Christine Keeler and Mandy Rice Davis of the Performo Affair appear in the Beatles anthology video, Free as a Bird at 307. And this video, you, you can run it backwards if you, it has more clues in it if you run it backwards. Um, it also includes Mary Pinnell Meyer at 257, wife of CIA man Cord Meyer and lover of John F. Kennedy. She was also murdered. And then they talk about a movement in France that after leaving Jane Asher, McCartney hung around with Ginsburg and Burroughs. These two were part of a movement that began in France called Les Beat. If you look at the Beatles, the Sergeant Pepper cover, you can see Les Beat backwards. L-E-S-B-E-A-T. I don't know um, what to think about all that. I think he did. He was given um, the song in a dreamlike state, at least the melody. I do think he composed the words or part of the words on that one because it was like a, his own eulogy. I should also mention that Billy, in an interview or two, talks about the fact that there was a piano in his bedroom. Yes. At the Asher's home. So, And you mentioned that Richard Asher wrote for The Lancet. And just so folks know, The Lancet is a Harvard Medical 
publication. Okay, so Richard Asher was no slouch. And so he and his wife, uh, according to memoirs, were involved in putting biological Paul into trance, into hypnosis, and then playing the melody to Yesterday. And if you go back to my presentation, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music? That melody goes back to an old Neapolitan song. And I'll put the link down below for anybody who hadn't watched um, that presentation. So I found this footnote to be very interesting. Sally, what are your thoughts? Going to the part where um, Bill explains that uh, Jim, his father, was telling him that all of this fixation on death, that he's bringing this about his own death by this fixation with it. Really interesting wording that Bill, Bill put was he said, Paul felt as if he had been emancipated from his father enough to be able to have his own decisions and and to follow his own path. What does emancipated from his father mean? I mean, that is obviously he is being controlled by his father. Emancipated would be releasing a slave or a minor child, not a grown man. Right. To me, Jim was controlling his son. Yeah, I, I always felt that there had to be, obviously, some adult faction that was involved in what was going on and, and how this whole thing was being brought about. When I say being brought about, being handled and groomed, because I do believe that the Beatles were handled and groomed from an early age. This is a suspicion that I have. Absolutely. It's possible that his father was involved. As uh, in the book, the new book, it tells us that John was sponsored by an uncle. I don't know if you picked up on that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I don't know, you know, some of the stuff that we have suspected uh, appears to be panning out as we go along, as more time elapses, and the book reveals more and more information. There's one other thing I'd like to point out is that in the footnote, he mentions uh, how ISIS got pregnant could be through in vitro fertilization. In ancient Egypt, there's one thing I've learned about reading that book is that he's not throwing words out there for nothing. So what 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 do you mean by that, Sally? Uh, with as it pertains to the Beatles. Well, that very well could be that that these Beatles were bred and groomed for this. Oh, I see. You're saying that it was it's not organic, it's not natural. Yep. It was created. Gotcha. Okay. Ofer, what are your thoughts on on the footnote on page 17? Well, um, according to the Guinness World uh, Records, uh, yesterday is the most covered song of all time. And also, to borrow from the theater world, for me, this was always and still is a showstopper. So every time I hear this song on the radio, it's very emotional to me. And maybe it's because I grew up with the song. Now, the fact that the whole context of the song changed, as we are told in memoirs, was one of the strongest moments for me, in fact, one of the biggest shocks from reading uh, about it. So disclosure happens twice here. First, we learned that the song was written in a mind control exercise. So that's one thing. And also the whole context of the song gets a new life because if you, we related the song always to Paul losing his mom at the age, age of 14. So the line, I said something wrong to me was always about not speaking nicely to your mother or fighting with your mother. And now that she's gone, he feels sorry that he behaved that way. So this is a common feeling for people who have lost their loved ones. Now with the whole new story of the, the meeting in Sweden and the occult thing uh, between an unidentified man and John and Paul, the lyrics get a whole new meaning. So on page 365, attributing the imminent, eminent death to the oath, Paul cries, I said something wrong. So the context here is about his fear of dying and about his nightmares and something wrong that he may, be, may have said in the, the meeting in Sweden. And the meeting in Sweden, Ofer, just so folks understand, would be when we were told in October of 1963 when they did the Faustian bargain. Yeah. 
this was like a big shock to me. So there's a lot of mystery and esoteric meaning around the most covered song in history. So this is something that we uh, we can think about. Yeah, it gets very dark and disturbing. This is what I was talking about in the beginning. You know, it's you start to learn more about the underpinnings of these songs and what they really represent, and it's troubling. Can't you imagine, though, you can't get this song out of your head. Think how he must have felt. This song is there. This tune is there, and it won't turn off. No matter what he does, it's always there. So he thinks, okay, well, maybe I'll write some words to it. You know, I, I kind of think it was a way of them trying to see if they could get them to be more plausible with writing songs, making the whole thing plausible deniability better for them because they weren't writing the quality of songs that they needed them to. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying that they implanted songs through through sessions like hypnosis sessions, like it's mentioned on page 17, in order to say, hey, they came up with this song. I kind of feel sorry for him. You know how it feels when you can't get something out of your head? He was walking around like that for a while with that song. Yeah. In fact, the story that Billy tells is that he was going around and asking people if they had ever heard this song before because he had the tune in his head. And uh, he actually went to George Martin. And Billy's telling the story. Obviously, it wasn't Billy having the discussion, but playing the part of Paul McCartney. This is the story that he's relaying. And George Martin saying, no, oh, that hadn't heard that song before, <laughs> which is, you know, that's, that's not true, right? If the footnote on page 17 tells us that the song came about through a hypnosis session or a series of hypnosis sessions. And George Martin was encouraging Paul's relationship with Jane Asher to ensure the connection into the Ashers, into her father, Richard, and her mother, Margaret. It all comes together. Right? I think it, it ties out. All right. Well, let me just move to um, our next question. It's related. So we have the footnote on page 40, which discusses the quote, the lead songwriter. And how some songs were based on feelings or issues Paul and John discussed. The book on page 49 also alludes to George Martin writing Michelle after Paul recited the lyrics. The footnote on page 75 clearly explains how the lads did not cut it with a set of songs they were learning. The book tells us that the vocals were weak, the guitars lacked precision, and the drumming was distracting. And page 77 tells us, Session musicians were used to record the early songs. And then I went on to ask you guys, setting aside my research into whether they wrote their own music, what is your personal opinion on their ability to write and record their own music? Now, again, strip out my research. What does your gut tell you about their ability to write music? Let's start with Ofer. Well, we, we get a lot of information from, from the book and also from um, just thinking about the way other musicians have operated. And one of the things we, we talked about, uh, you and I previously, was that uh, whenever they performed, there was almost no relation between new songs appearing on their albums to their performances playlists. So this was very noticeable with Revolver, but we also are pretty sure that this happened on the any of the first seven albums for sure. And after album seven, they didn't they didn't continue, they stopped performing, so <laughs> there was no problem there. But uh, we get a lot of information uh, from memoirs and other pieces that tie in together. I mean the. George Martin admitting that he admired their looks, but not their playing abilities, by understanding the Wrecking Crew model and the Mercy Beat article and a lot of things we discussed before. And I'm convinced that uh, they didn't write almost any any of the songs themselves. Yeah, from 62 through 66, Alfer? Yeah, until Sergeant Pepper, yeah. Okay, so I'm with you on that. So you and I are in sync on that. But like I said, just strip out the work that I've done. Sally, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, going back to what Ofer said about the, the wrecking crew, and this is way before I um, got into the um, Cartney conspiracy, was uh, watching the re wrecking crew. So it just seems pretty consistent 
you take people that you want to make idols out of them and you just hand them music and tell them to do this or do that. And uh, we've caught so many times. I mean, uh, the monkeys is a perfect example. There's a song where nobody's paying attention to Mike, the guitar player. Mike Nesmith, yeah. Yeah, nobody's paying attention to what he's doing. His tie is caught in his guitar strings. But everybody's so paying attention to the lead singer that they're not paying attention to what he's doing back there. I saw that clip, and it's as if Mike was telling the audience, the viewers, yeah, it's all fake. Yep. Vicki, what are your thoughts? I think they were very busy people. I mean, you're talking about people that at, at that moment were in, a, were in films, you know, they had to learn lines. They had to, they had to have a social uh, appearance out at parties. They had to do this. They had to do that. I don't see how there could have been any time for writing. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I do. You know, I, I write articles and different things. But when I'm busy with my full time job, full time plus job, sometimes I can't. I have to do that. You know, when I'm on vacation or something anymore, I just can't be that fresh and be creative. And I think that's the case with most people that they didn't have time to write the songs. The record company just decided what um, they were going to be and made them into that. And then they realized, Oh, well, they will be super. It'll be a super group. If they write their own music and they, and they sing it and they play it and they can do everything. They'll be super people. So I, I just don't, I do think that John was a poet. I think he probably had a few lyrics. Now, I don't mean they were unedited. Uh, he did write Strawberry Fields, right? Well, that's what we're told. <laughs> I, well, looking at Strawberry Fields, after, when you put that into context, when he wrote it after Paul died, it seems a little bit more um, possible anyway. But, I, I mean, I, I don't think that they could have written much. I do think there were probably some poems and some lines and some topics and maybe a melody or two or a harmony that they came up with. Um, I do think they contributed something, but I just don't think, I don't even think it's really fair to expect them to have done all that when they already did all the other things, the touring and the films and, and the social appearances and all that. I just, I, I don't think there is any humanly way possible that they could have written the songs. I, that's just the record company and the um, yeah George Martin yeah that they wanted to bring out there. That that's my opinion on it. Okay, and and I have a clip of George Martin admitting that the uh, the guitar lead or the melody in uh, Michelle and maybe I'll drop it into this show was his composition. And he said that, and which is interesting because we have stories from Billy telling us that he was playing Michelle back at some French cafe somewhere. Remember that story? And then we have George Martin coming out and saying, no, nope, I wrote that. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, contradictory types of information, and uh, it's up to us to try to piece it together. Now, let me ask this question here along the lines with the music. What was George Martin and Theodore Adorno's role in the music? And my personal belief is that Theodore Adorno was responsible for the overall uh, aggregation or the uh, the gathering up of songs. It's not to say that Adorno didn't write some of the songs, but I think of him more in terms of in a overall supervisory or managerial capacity with regard to the music and working side by side with George Martin. And again, that is what I think is possible. So, Ofer, going back to you, what do you think George Martin's role was and Theodore Adorno, if you believe Adorno had a role? Well, first of all, I think that we have to replace the Lennon and McCartney uh, with Shepard Martin, maybe, next to many of the songs, because I think both of them are heavily involved in the writing and producing uh, of the songs from the very beginning. I think that uh, George Martin contributed a lot more than just producing. And I think that Billy wrote a lot of the songs himself. Now, I also suspect that uh, he was probably one of the session musicians on early Beatles records because he was talented. He was around along with many other uh, people, maybe even young Jimmy Page. Now, as for Adorno, uh, I 
read, uh, of course, Dr. Um, uh, John Coleman's book, he, I think that Adorno was definitely involved too. I always thought that he was involved with the classical parts. For example, the classical part in Michel. It could be Adorno and maybe on other arrange, arrangements because he was very knowledgeable and experienced with the classical music, talking about Adorno. But who knows? Well, Adorno was also teaching. He was uh, lecturing. He was writing books. He was a prolific book writer. And that's why when I did my presentation, I had a hard time believing that Adorno was writing all of the music. And it's not to say he didn't write some of the music, but I tend to believe that uh, there were a group of songwriters, especially through the uh, from 1962 through 1966, that were tapped to uh, be the primary songwriters and to create the content that the Beatles would wind up singing to or learning the songs and then taking them out on the road. Okay, well, let's move to uh, Sally. What are your thoughts about A, George Martin, and then give me your thoughts on uh, Theodore Adorno. Yeah, I read the, the Committee of 302, so I agree with Ofer that um, that Theodore Adorno did a lot of uh, the classical. George was, if you want to put it, that he was the Beatles handler. I mean, he was uh, overseeing what they did. He was he was instructed to do it, and and that was his job. And uh, Theodora Dono, Dorno, the same thing is that they have instructions from on high, and uh, they fulfill it. And I look at both of them as exactly that role. Yeah, I think that they were both in a like a managing director type of role. George Martin closer to the action. But that doesn't mean that Adorno was too far from the action. I think Adorno's role was to oversee the overall operation from a musical perspective and to report that back to Tavistock. That's how I think the hierarchy may have worked. But again, that's just my thoughts. Vicki, what is your take on George Martin and then Theodore Adorno? I was a little bit different. I, I also own the Committee of 300 book. It's uh, required reading for anybody. <laughs> Who wants to research this topic? But I, um, I kind of had the feeling, and I'm not really sure why I feel this way, but I thought Adorno maybe was more in charge with the things of the music, of the technical nature, like the frequency, the vibration, the beat, the things that make it addictive to the listeners. Good point. But Adorno was more of a mystery person and we know he's tied to Tavistock so he must there must be another step there because the music when it came out was addictive like Doritos or something to its listeners they just they couldn't get enough it was different than other groups at the time I think yeah I would agree with you and that's a that's a very good uh, take on what Adorno's role may have been was to get more into the frequencies and maybe the, um, how do I explain this? When I used to listen to psychedelic music, I remember as a kid, I would listen to Sgt. Pepper. I would get a sense of colors. Of course, there was a lot of work that was done by Stanford Research Institute and Tavistock that had to do uh, with frequencies and its impact and effect on humans. And of course, with uh, Adorno being tied into Tavistock, along with Willis Harmon, who was mentioned in the uh, memoirs of Billy Shears, another social scientist. It's quite possible that your take on this is, uh, is one aspect that Adorno was involved in. So, All right, let's move to the next question. Many footnotes in memoirs go deeper into the agenda of the New World Order and clearly indicate the Beatles as an entity were and still are instrumental in Tavistock's social engineering initiative. So here's a question that comes up a lot. Whenever I talk about this, I will get these comments, and sometimes people will even email me. How much do you think the Beatles knew about what they were involved in? Ofer, we'll start with you. I think that at the very beginning, when they were young, they did not know or they were not aware of the entire uh, structure. And then they were promised... Uh, what we now know as a death for success uh, back in Sweden. I'm referring to Biopol and John. And 
maybe and as young people you know if if someone comes to you and said listen i'm going to make you the most famous musicians that ever was and your songs will be carried centuries after you you're gone then this was this looked uh, very appealing to them but i i think that uh, the turning point or the change was when uh, biopore was gone and then they the, the, the rest of them uh, started to to figure out that um, there's a much uh, broader uh, picture and i'm not including billy because i think billy was you know he knew all along okay there's a quote on page 594 the weight of it all did not begin to hit john until paul died john then became unstable and i think that george and ringo began to understand more than more too at that point of time so the turning point was the death of uh, biopol do you think they ever got to the point oh for where they felt like they were in over their heads was there a moment when they they had the revelation or the epiphany that you know what this goes way beyond what we were told this was going to be maybe towards the end or after the breakup yeah sally what are your thoughts uh well getting back to i think they were bred and groomed for this role on a need to know basis what they were told was happening one of the footnotes alludes to that they were told that they would have to um turn their back on their uh, the christian beliefs which they were heritage i think is the way you put it that they were all in on this and the reality when paul died is um when john started you know whether you want to look at it is that his uh, his programming was starting to unravel bill does allude to that um that yoko was sent because john was so unstable which my question is how do you take somebody who's unstable and add somebody unstable as well that there's that's first supposed to straighten that person out because yoko in her own right seemed to be just as every bit as unstable as john was but i think that they were they have from from children been groomed to do this now whether or not they knew completely uh, everything that was going to happen i think it's just like uh, any um compartmentalized uh, structure is on a need to know basis what they needed to know is that they were going to be famous if they did this right so they dangled the carrot in front of them along the way and by the way you and i are basically on the same page because i believe they were groomed uh, very early on as well oh yeah and, yeah and then the carrot was dangled and that's how they were led down the path and uh you know and the way this thing works is you have to do it under your own volition so you have to agree so if they say to you hey we can give you more do you want more and you say yes then you're taking the next step and you know the more steps you take the deeper you go into the abyss so um uh, vicky what are your thoughts i i'm still kind of working on the idea of of them all being bred from birth about it although i will tell you if you look at their astrology charts um i'm not sure paul's is accurate because bill kind of took it over and some of that has been scrubbed off the internet the old bio paul stuff but i think that they were chosen maybe for their astrology or or maybe the final choice came down to astrology uh because they do use that a lot another thing is i think they each had a foundation in the new world order in other words when they grew up they were told this or that is you know you're going to be special something like that you're going to be so this is why we we do this exercise or or whatever i do think there was a grooming by their respective handlers and i do think that's why the two mothers were removed early in their life so they didn't interfere i'm not sure bio paul is really jim's son i don't know sally and i have knocked around maybe he was a war baby uh because the mom was a midwife maybe um maybe they maybe he was a moon child i don't know she would have to be bloodline probably but anyway back to your your question i i think that i mean i can watch john and see that he knew it all along and he was on board with it he might not have known everything but he knew the basics i don't think they realized how 
deep they were in it until they actually killed off Bio Paul. I think you see John change. I, I don't really see much of the band thereafter. I mean, they did go to the recording sessions and sit there and play around on their instruments, but I don't really think they, they did too much. They each got a few songs in there, or so they say. Beyond that, I, I don't think that after Paul died that the other three were really part of the band unless it was required that they be there for looks. I, I just think they kind of gave up and quit. Let's move to um, – I'm going to skip uh, question 10 because we kind of covered that uh, as far as uh, the involvement of uh, Jim McCartney, and I mentioned that uh, John was spoken for by his uncle, so I don't, don't want to repeat that. So if we go to page 273 – and over, you and I talked about this in one of our earlier shows, but the footnote on 273 drops a clue that Billy wrote, I want to hold your hand, when he was with the Pepper Potts to help George Martin teach the Beatles the song. And so that begs the question, how long do you think Billy was involved with the Beatles? And Sally, let's start with you this time. Was Billy a late ad in the fall of 1966, or was he around way before that time. Oh, he's been there from the beginning. <laughs> he's been there from the beginning in one of the uh I think it's in the footnotes he he mentions that that him and Paul had been watched from the beginning. That pretty much seals it for me that he he's been involved in this from the get go. He's been writing for them. He just like over said a, a session musician involved in their early records. I think he's been involved in this from the very beginning. Vicki, what are your thoughts? I think the footnote said supposedly they met on July 5th, 63 at a venue, but I think he was around much sooner, maybe 61, 62 even. That, that's my opinion. He, w- he was there from the start, probably before the start, because George Martin, as big of a task as this was, knew he couldn't write every song. He knew he couldn't do that. He knew he had to have help. And, I mean, he and Bill are pretty pretty close. That's somebody he could have gone to and said, you know, will you help me with songs? And who could have done it? I don't know. I, I don't listen to I Want to Hold Your Hand and hear um, Bill in that song. You know, he kind of has his own style. I don't hear it, but it doesn't mean he couldn't have done it. He could write a song that doesn't sound like him if he wanted to. I'm sure he did it all the time with Viv. So I think he's been there from the start. It was just a setup from the start. Okay. Ofer, what are your thoughts about how early Billy got involved? He wrote many of the early hits on side of the Beatles, and I suspect that he was one of the musicians that uh, George Martin hired for their recordings. And he was on the sideline waiting to take his turn. Okay, because the way I look at it is, I, I believe Billy was there very early as well, uh, at least starting in 1962, and I agree that it could be even earlier. Uh, I do believe it's possible that he did write songs in the early days that were used as demos that were handed over to George Martin, and then George Martin took those songs and he went off and taught the Beatles some of these songs, not all of them, so that they can take them out on the road and play them live. So I, I do believe Billy was there very early on. And as I mentioned, I don't believe he was the only songwriter. I believe they had a kludge of songwriters in the early days from 62 to 66 where they, uh, they had like a team of songwriters that were submitting material. And not everything that somebody wrote made it onto a record. There was a selection process that George Martin went through, maybe even Theodore Adorno, to say that song, that one, that one, that one, no, that one, no that one no, that one yes. So they went through a vetting process to decide which songs would wind up on the albums. Okay, but we all agree that Billy didn't just show up in the fall of 1966. <laughs> and that would make sense because uh, it, would, it would make the whole situation just a lot more difficult to bring it all together and to integrate it. So if they had somebody that they knew, somebody that was active and participating in what was going on, it, it just made it a lot easier to bring them in because they were already on board with what was going on as well as the direction that they were looking to take the band and the music. Okay, so next question. There are many people within the PID community, Paul is dead, that deny 
Billy played the Bonzo version of Stanshall. And my question to the team here is, did Billy play the Stanshall character in the Bonzos? And why is it so hard for so many people to see it? Because from my personal perspective, I've put up a lot of different images, which for me, it clearly shows that he did play the character of Stanshall in the Bonzos. And Vicky, let's start with you this time. What's your take on Billy and Vivian and the Bonzos? Yes, he did. I, I think I'm going to go about this a little differently because it keeps coming up. And I, I'm not a big Viv person. I don't spend a lot of time on Viv, but it's obvious to me that's the same person. I just want to say when, this sounds cheesy, but when you're waking up, when you're becoming awake, sometimes you hit little things that don't resonate right. And everyone just has a different speed and timing and, and things that, that they can take in and maybe they're not, just not ready for the Viv thing yet. I mean, this is a lot, a lot of stuff at once. And I know this is a hang up with a lot of people and I don't get it. I mean, it's, it's obvious to me, but um just kind of remembering back to that time that English humor was, was big, like in the late early seventies on television. Do you remember Monty Python and Benny Hill, that, that kind of stuff. Right. It's just another version of that kind of thing. It, it's just, it was a hobby. If you don't see that, don't feel bad about it. Just open your mind and come back and revisit it later once you let some of the other things absorb. And, and I think it will sink in because I know a lot of people have a hard time with that and I don't understand why. It, it seems just obvious to me. Well, one of the things that they get hung up on is they don't realize that there was a, another Vivian Stanchel, which was Victor. And so when you look at Victor, you don't, you don't see it, right? And also, I had mentioned in a video that it's possible that Greg Masters from Idle Race, uh, he was in the band with Jeff Lynn going back into the 1960s, is another uh, possible character or person that played the character of Stanshall periodically. And so that's, that's three Stanshalls if Greg did play that role, two for sure, because we know Victor played the role. So I, I agree with your assessment, Vicki, that as you're going through this, it's hard enough sometimes for some people to get their heads around that Paul McCartney was replaced, right? And then to go say, hey, look, and he was also Vivian Stanshall in the Bonzos. And then you just, your head explodes because right away you can't see it. You have this, you know, kind of this uh, reddish blonde hair and all of this stuff. And people really can't get their heads wrapped around the fact that there's latex, there's, there's cosmetics, there was plastic surgery and all of this stuff that created the transformation. I, I don't want to say I'm a psychologist or anything, but you got to remember, this is a guy who lives inside of a lives inside of bio Paul McCartney and he can't go out and tell everybody everything. So he's trying I, in my mind, he was just trying to release some energy there, some, you know, trying to be himself somehow deep in there because he couldn't be himself anymore. Playing with the Bonzos, you said. Playing with the Bonzos. It was a relief. Yeah, I agree. Sally, what are your thoughts? Again, going back to, there's a video floating around called uh, The Funniest Moments of Paul McCartney. And see the different personalities that this man takes on during that. It's just uh, little blips of uh, interviews and stuff like that. He goes into 25 different voices, personalities. It's totally consistent. With uh, Vivian Stanshaw, he's just one more of his uh, different uh, personalities. Like you said, get past the surgeries and the this and the that and just look at the person who is pretending or who is playing Vivian Stanshaw and then compare it with the different personalities that this man playing Paul McCartney is doing and it's pretty easy to see. You know what's clear to me, Sally, is that when I read memoirs and then I watch clips of Billy, that it is very easy for me to see that the person that I'm watching on the video who's speaking and, like you said, speaking in different voices and the way he jokes around, that that is the same person. Exactly. That is in the book. Yes, absolutely. Every time I see an interview with him now, it, it's like, that's him. That's who he's describing in memoirs. Because that personality comes out in the book. Yes. And then you actually see him in that personality when you're watching his interviews and he's on talk shows. I saw an interview and I sent it to Tom 
And he said, yep, that's a good catch. He was talking to, I don't remember who it was, but anyway, he he said, one of these days I may even write an autobiographical fiction novel. Right. There you go. I remember that one. But if you can find that, send it to me, and I'll I'll put it into the uh, into the show here. Oprah, what are your thoughts about Billy playing Stancho on the Bonzos? I go along with the explanation in memoirs about the Bonzos and the relations between uh, Victor and Billy. And if you watch a lot of the Wings and then the solo career videos of um, Billy, like coming up from 1980, uh, if you watch that video, he has 11 or 10 uh, lookalikes. One of them is uh, is joking about Biopol, actually. Yeah. So he's an actor. He's uh, coming in and out of costumes, of surgeries, of uh, different personas. That's who he is. Yeah, he likes to act. He likes to put on a show. No doubt about it. So let's let's move to uh, Mike McGear because this is something that, to be honest with you, I haven't spent a lot of time on Mike McGear. I did look into him uh, when I was looking into the scaffold, and the scaffold was tied into Vivian Stanshaw. Uh, but I haven't paid a lot of mind to Mike McGear. I, I always thought that he didn't have any resemblance to biological Paul McCartney at all. But, you know, that in itself doesn't mean that it's he's not Biopol's brother, because I know a lot of brothers and sisters that if you put them in a room together and you didn't tell somebody they were related, people wouldn't know they were related because they look so different. But, Ofa, let's go back to you on Mike McGear. Do you believe he's Biological Paul's brother or is he an actor? What are your thoughts? I think he's uh, Biopol's brother, for all I know. No, fair enough. That's... That's all we know, right? <laughs> okay, I just want to cover this question because it gets asked a lot. It shows up in the comments section a lot. Vicki, what are your thoughts on uh, Mike McGear? Back to the Viv thing, I just want to add one other thing. It could also be an alter since he has the mind control. You know, they have alter egos that they act out. Good point. Okay, Mike McGear, I, this is one of the very first things when I started looking into Paul is Dead that I tried to figure out. And I just kept coming to a dead end on it. And finally, when I reread Billy's back this weekend, and it explained it one more time that Mike was part of the part of the, um, you know, he, he was already new Billy. He understood why they were doing this. And and then there are reasons that he wouldn't want to come out because he doesn't want to get anything bad to happen to him. I mean, I could, I finally could kind of see it then. However, I want to go all the way back to the beginning I, with what Sally and I were talking about. I'm not sure if they're brothers or not, but I think that the parents acquired those two boys at the same time. Maybe it was birth, but I think that the mom got them from through her work. She was a midwife. I think they were directed to Jim because he was the handler. Uh, they were older. They were much older, and it was wartime. And I think, you know, there were all kinds of babies that didn't have parents or people couldn't take care of them, whatever. There were a lot of orphans. Of orphans, and she was a midwife. And for her to just bring home two babies, they could have been brothers or not, is, is very possible. But, uh, yeah, I finally did accept that Mike understands everything that was you know, that he was signing off and changing his name and the whole bit and and just went along with it because he, he's just going along with it like everybody has. Right. Now, the next question, this is one that we get asked a lot. I know I've been asked a lot and I'm sure you have. I know Ofer, you have because you wrote the book. By the way, folks, Ofer has uh, written a uh, Paul is Dead book and it's the first one of its kind in Israel. And, and Ofer and I have talked about this in a show that we did, the last one we did. But now, People say that the conspiracy cannot work because too many people know about the Beatles who have worked with them in the studio or who were friends and so on. That's what I mean by that. And therefore, someone would have said something. So, in other words, it's impossible to contain the conspiracy. This is something that we've all heard. And how do you respond to that? And Ofer, let me start with you because you and I have talked about this and I know you've been asked this question. So what do you say when people say, come on, this can't happen? 
Well, the circle, the circle of people who knew in the 1960s, I think, was not that large. So the whole thing was not that difficult to hide. That's my opinion. There were no means of uh, fast spreading of information like today's. So I think it was easier to hide the stuff. I think that uh, several people uh, who threatened to disclose were taken care of. And the musicians in the inner circles that uh, are mentioned in the book also, you know, the Stones and the Who and Donovan, they were part of the inner circle. So they were either, they either knew to keep quiet or they were told to keep quiet. Or they wrote songs about Paul is dead. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. right. And they're still obligated not to disclose the biggest switch in music history. I think pulling this today was probably close to impossible. But in the 1960s, no problem. Yeah, because there was no Internet. There was no mass media. And then they've had decades to adjust, alter and doctor images and videos. So I, I've, I've said to folks that, you know, they have been doctoring images and pictures since uh, since day one because they knew exactly what it is that uh, they were going to do and where this was going. And so there were a lot of photos and images of uh, Biopaul, of lookalikes and doubles and so on. And so the whole thing gets very, very convoluted very quickly. Sally, what are your thoughts? How do you respond to people when they say, there's no way you can keep the lid on this thing? There's no way you can keep the lid on the the uh, moon landing, <laughs> or <laughs> you name it. it. Actually, we could we could use what's going on in the world right yeah. now as an example. It's, I was trying to figure out how to word it. <laughs> yeah, no, we could just say current events. What's yes. currently happening? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what's currently happening right now, folks, is a gigantic psychological operation, and there are many people out there that see through it and are trying to wake other people up to what's going on and what are the other people doing they they don't see it they don't want to hear it they just don't connect into what's really going on and how the world really operates and so you have to ask yourself why would it be any different going back to another psychological operation known as the Beatles or like Sally said the Apollo missions or 9-11 and so on I mean we can we, we have a list that could be a mile long of all the psyops that took place that people are oblivious to, and will also say to any one of those other conspiracies, come on, how can that possibly have been pulled off? Even with the JFK assassination, I've had people tell me, how could the CIA be involved in the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover and LBJ and all of these people, the military industrial complex, and nobody said anything? Well, folks, it's 60 somewhat years later. And all the history books still tell us Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone shooter. Anyway, so, Vicki, what are your thoughts? How do you answer that question? Uh, can you say Brian Epstein, Mal Evans, Brian Jones, George Harrison, Tara Brown? They all knew. Right. But what happened to them? <laughs> they, they didn't have long lives. None of them did. Well, even if they did have long lives, Vicky, right? I mean, they're in the club. They're not going to say anything. They're not going to say anything. I mean, they have told us over and over. There's all these books. The Monkeys television show, you know, the movie That Thing You Do. There's some more stuff in there. there it's all over the place. They've been telling us, and they're laughing at you because you're not even getting anything. Open your eyes and open your mind and say, well, could that happen? Could that really be? I mean, they switched Darren on Bewitched. I didn't even notice as a kid that they switched him out. That, well, that's Darren, that's Darren, and then everybody's watched a, another show or soap opera or something. They switch people out all the time. It's not that big of a deal. It's just this one was more high profile, and they got away with it. But this was the test. This was the test for the rest of them, mostly. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, with Tavistock, when they realized that – um that not many people picked up on the swap of Paul McCartney, the replacement. Now, of course, there were people that noticed the difference and said something, but you know, that got overridden by the vast majority of the population that didn't see it, didn't pay any attention, were apathetic, didn't care, called it nonsense, right? So there had to come a point when Tavistock realized they got over the hurdle. They must have all went out that night and got drunk. 
right? Because they're thinking to themselves, this is unbelievable. We can actually swap out one of the most prominent entertainers, musicians in the world, in the biggest band in the world, and nobody cared. Nobody saw it, right? So think about that. Think about how Tavistock would look at that as a coup. It's pretty incredible. All right, so let's go to the next question. We could just answer this one real quick. Is Alistair Crowley, or Crowley, depending upon how you want to pronounce his last name, Billy's father? Vicki? I mean, I don't have 100% proof on this, obviously. Nobody would. But I have really looked into this part, and I, I think he was either his father or a very close relative of some sort. Um, I did purchase a book called um, Netherwood, and it's about Aleister Crowley's last years, and it's really about the house, but there's several chapters about Aleister Crowley in there and who visits them and everything. So I am trying to find, as I go through and find a name, I stop and I go back and research that person to see if that is Bill or his mother or see, you know, it's slow going. It's really slow going through this book, but it's it's a really neat look if anybody ever has a chance to read it. If you have a link, um, send it to me and I'll put it in the description box below. Well, unfortunately, this is one of those books that is kind of like expensive and you can only buy it on the Internet and you can't read a uh, one of those. OK, but um, it is really good. Uh, I Yeah. I mean, that that's his dad, in my opinion. Um, at this point, I've got enough that I, I feel pretty confident about it. But I, I've looked at that a lot, a lot of ways. And I don't know how they're hiding that direct connection. I don't know if they just scrubbed everything or how they're doing it. But but yeah, that's his son. And um, I, I just can't quite connect the dots. But I believe it to be so. You know, one of the questions I get asked every once in a while, people will say, how could biological Paul McCartney be dead? Because if he were dead, there would be a death certificate. And I think to myself, hello, deep state. You know, it's just, it's amazing to me what people don't get and don't understand. They don't connect the dots that, you, you know, there's a deep state that can do whatever it is they want to do. Any record that they want to have available, they create. Any record that they don't want to have around, they can delete. So I don't know. I, I, I just I digress there a little bit. Now, Ofer, what are your thoughts on Crowley being Billy's father? I'm still undecided if he's Billy's metaphorical father, a sort of a mentor or a guru, or indeed his biological father. I really don't know. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. All right, so I want to go back to a question that I actually um, missed. So, and we don't have to spend a lot of time on this because it can be very involved. And I just want to get your thoughts with regard to what was your initial take when you read the new version of Memoirs and it got into Egyptian mythology and in particular Osiris and Horus. So when you were reading those passages, what, what was going through your mind? Sally, what did you think when you started reading this? Because this was really new as far as this information being brought forth. I mean, we knew about the Egyptian ties in previous versions, but in this version of Memoirs, Tom goes into a lot of detail in the footnotes. So what were your thoughts? Uh, well, it was uh, very dark, that's for sure. And he really gets into describing how the spirit can move from one plane to another of existence. That one, I'm still having a hard time processing exactly how all of this took place. I mean, there's mysteries and secrets that people like you and me are never probably going to be uh, privy to. That, uh, And that he was, at whatever level he's allowed to disclose, that's what he was trying to uh, convey there. But, I mean, the Osiris and Horus, those are just a part of the whole gods that we will get into in, in another show. Yeah, we'll talk about that. But basically, folks, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if I understood the book correctly in Tom's footnotes, that biological Paul McCartney and Billy are participating in a ritual that has to do with Osiris and Horus. And Billy would be Horus. The book is telling us that Billy is a, quote, God. 
Now, I'm not saying I agree that Billy is a god, because if he is, I think we're in big trouble. <laughs> but but that's what the book was putting forth, and I don't even think Tom agrees with that. Tom is writing the book based upon information that he's receiving in. It's incoming, right? Then he has to go through the incoming material and puts it into the book. But it was it was very weird. Vicki, what were your thoughts when you were reading these passages? Well, I'm not quite as advanced as Sally <laughs> on the Egyptian stuff, but I do want to add, they have put clues out there that nobody got. And I think Bill finally said with Egypt Station, I'm just going to put it all out there, you know. Right. But like Diana Doors on the Pepper album, that's a moon goddess, Diana the moon goddess. You know, it's also uh, equated with the high priestess, which that's a tarot card. The whole, they put clues out there that go back to Egypt without them looking Egyptian. Okay. And um, I think it's just, I think it's been there all along. We just didn't understand what they were saying. Right. And I agree that it's out there. It's everywhere. And like you said, Vicki, sometimes it's not even specifically noted as Egyptian or you know, they're not wearing an Egyptian costume or anything like that. And sometimes it's very subdued and you have to read between the lines to get the uh, the clues or the implications of what it is they're trying to get across, the message that they're trying to communicate out. Ofer, what were your thoughts when you were reading um, these footnotes on Egypt and Osiris and Horus and so on? Well, to me, it helped uh, tie many loose points, uh, such as the dollar bill signs, the one eye symbolism that we see all over the entertainment world and the overall um, NOW agendas, for them, it's part of their belief. I mean, it, it's um, it's based on, on the Egyptian myth- uh, mythology. So it really connected a lot of dots for me. That's the thing. It, it's You're on a very good point here. It's, it's their religion. It's their spirituality. It's their philosophy. It's their tenets. This is what they believe. This is what they are communicating out because it's based upon an ideology yeah. that's based in Egyptian lore. It's like I said to you, Mike, a few weeks ago, is uh, if you want to know this stuff, you better walk like an Egyptian. <laughs> as the right, it, right. you got to do a deep dive into this or you're not going to understand it. And it's very complex. Yes. Understanding the Egyptian gods is very complex. Uh, it's, it's not something that's easily understood. You have to do a lot of research and a lot of studying. So let's go to the next question, which is related, I think. When we read about Paulism, now I did a video recently, it was titled The Gospel of Paul McCartney, and I got into Paulism. But what does it mean to you when you read memoirs, and now that we're more familiar with what Paulism is, because it actually went back to the original edition of the book, which came out in September of 2009, and each subsequent release or update to the book has gotten into a little more detail, but Sally, when we talk about Paulism, what does it mean to you? What what are they trying to tell us with Paulism? They're basically saying that a new religion is coming, and it incorporates um, all the ancient gods, and uh, the whole purpose of the the war on Christianity, uh, when they declared it in September 11th, 1962, is uh, this is where we're headed with everything, and you look at major corporations and stuff, they're all named after um, all the old gods, even the Apollo missions. I mean, all of this stuff, this is where we're headed with this. Well, the Committee of 300 refers to themselves as the Olympians. The Olympians. Okay, so Vicki, what are your thoughts on Paulism? I call it the cult of Paul. <laughs> I, I, I struggled with this one coming along Um I want to remind everyone that when studying Aleister Crowley, he came up with his own religions, and that's kind of what they've done here. So I can see correlations, basically. You know, if Aleister Crowley is supposed to be Bill's dad, and then, you know, Aleister Crowley came up with his own religions, and now Bill comes up with his own religion, which is Paulism, I think this is what... The famous, I say the famous people, the musicians or whatnot, are probably encouraged to uh, enjoy this flavor of whatever it is, whatever religious sect it comes from. But I I don't know. I mean, the jury's still out with me on Paulism a little bit. I I haven't really grasped that concept fully, I don't think. Yeah, it could be a bit elusive. I I have uh, deducted that Paulism is integrated with Thelema, which is 
Crowley's religion. So I think the, the two are intertwined very, very closely. That's just my own personal opinion. I wanted to give a quick example. When Betty White died and everyone was out there yelling, she was a witch and, and this and that. I, I don't know about all that, but I just kind of did a quick Google search to see what Betty White was really like, you know. And that, that show she used to be in called uh, Family, was it Family, um, you know, it was in the 80s and it was set in a rural area. Oh, I don't remember. I remember her from the Mary Tyler Moore show and uh, Golden Girls. Well, she had a bit role on the part with Vicki Lawrence and uh, was it Carol Burnett? And they had this show about old ladies and it was a rule show. I didn't watch it either. <laughs> but I'm just saying that the uh, I went back because she it said she had been a character on that. I went back to look at that. One of the characters was named Thelma and one of the other characters had the last name Crowley. Selma, Thelema, you know, and I, oh. that is no accident. And it was no. in the most innocent of places. So that's how far reaching all this is. And I, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's great. That's great that you picked up on that. Very good. Oh, for what does Paulism mean to you? Well, a couple of quick points. Um, John Lennon to, uh, told us I've seen religion from Jesus to Paul. It's right there. That's one thing. And the second thing, and I, really hope I'm not offending anyone. Uh, well, since we are presented with the uh, situation that Paul is a god, and then we can ask ourselves, okay, but what is, where is his Bible? And it could be that we bought the third version of it just last September, October, <laughs> and we're reading it and discussing it. It has stories related to what happened with layered meanings, just as in the real Bible. So maybe this is uh, some kind of, you know, an explanation that we're getting, or uh, maybe I'm going too far with that, you know. No, I mean, that's very perceptive. That's very perceptive. So, uh, yeah, maybe the books are a foundation for the aspects of this one world religion. That That's what they're driving toward, folks, is a one world government, one world religion, it goes back to uh, the Aquarian Conspiracy, uh, the Human Potential Movement going back into the 1960s. This is all something that has been ongoing for decades now. So but that was a very, very good observation, Ofer. Now, here's the, here's the question that I know we probably have all been waiting for. I know that when we all read the footnote on page 557, it was shocking. So I'm going to ask you your input and uh, your perspective on that footnote talking about a massive depopulation. And uh, Sally, let's go to you first, because I know you and I have talked about this when the book first came out, and we took a look at that passage, and it was very disturbing. So when you read it, what were your thoughts? Well, um, we're seeing it playing out right in front of us, uh, the depopulation, without going too deep into this. Um, because of current events yes current events thank you um we're we're watching it play out and it it was shocking when i read it and then after it, it took me a while to process it and then i realized well he's telling the truth once again uh he's not trying to say this is horrible he's not trying to say this is good he's just laying the facts out this is what's happening yeah because the footnote is saying that the way I read it, this depopulation agenda that they have is something that they they are implementing. I'm not going to say they're going to implement. It's, it's underway as we speak. Mm -hmm. And that this needs to get done in order to clear the decks for the new world order, the one world government, the one world religion. In other words, they don't want 7 billion people, if people actually believe that's the number, right? There's always a debate about whether there's actually 7 billion people or it's another made-up number. But let's just say it's real. And the Georgia Guidestones say they want to manage it down to 500 million people. So basically, you know, the footnote on page 557 was saying, hey, we got a lot of deck clearing to do so that we get down to the uh, the core population. And from there, the New World Order will move forward with a lot less people. That was my take. So, Vicki, what were your thoughts when you read the footnote on 557? Well, I'm not surprised. I wasn't surprised because I've kind of been, you know, studying this 
or been whatever for for some time now, they don't really have a problem sometimes with just putting their playbook out there. I mean, doubles and, uh, you know, we figured a lot of it out, but they don't seem to have a problem with this. I think they, I think that they told this to the Beatles in the beginning and it was also mind blowing. They're like, Oh yeah, 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 we'll play your game thinking none of this could ever be true. And I didn't think massive depopulation could ever happen either, but I look around and it's happening. When I said it was shocking to read in the book, I didn't mean that I was shocked that there was a depopulation agenda. I've been talking about that for years. I was surprised to see it in memoirs, is what I'm saying. Oh, well, yeah, but it's all the same. I mean, all the, these psyops are just cousins with each other. I mean, they use the same basic playbook. Right. They're applied differently, depending what your topic is. But I kind of wondered if, if the Beatles didn't know this from the beginning, if they weren't told, oh, you're going to usher in this new age of Aquarius and you're going to bring us into the 70s and, and you're going to we're going to do psychedelic and everybody's going to lose it, innocence. And then eventually what's going to happen is a bunch of people will die off and um, then it'll just be left with this utopia and people like us not ever being able to comprehend that, yeah, you really can depopulate people you can put something in their water supply or or their arm <laughs> or right. whatever else and um i mean i just think that's part of part of the whole plan and it's been that way and it's been out there and they've said it i mean it was on jesse ventura 10 20 years ago whenever he was around he was talking about it i don't know i i I know what you're saying. You were surprised to see it. But by the time it came out, I was not surprised to see it because there was too much alignment with everything else happening around me that I, I was that surprised. Yeah, I just didn't I just didn't think it was going to. Uh, again, I was just surprised that it, it popped up in memoirs. And and the interesting thing was it was so far back in the book, you know, by the time you got to it, you're like, holy smokes. So let me let me go to Ofer real quick. Ofer, what? Your thoughts on the footnote on page 557. I know you wrote me an email a number of months ago and you said, Mike, this is very disturbing stuff. It is very disturbing, but I'm going to present a kind of a more uh, conservative way of thinking. I still think that uh, there's a gap between words that people are saying, and these are terrible words. I mean, no doubt about it. Now, I'm not saying that uh, bad things don't happen. Of course they do. And, and, uh, but what I'm what I'm saying is, uh, and, and we see world leaders uh, stating all kinds of things related to the depopulation. But I still think that there's a long way to go. I mean, and I, I still think that the way the world is structured, it's not that easy to take to, to carry out. That that's what I'm saying. I mean, there's still a gap in my mind, at least. Now, we get another footnote on page 295. If some globalists have their way, everyone will be tracked and controlled by chips embedded in our bodies. And we know that there's a globalist uh, who said that just recently. So we get these things. We hear these things. I'll give you another example. I mean, one of the, one of the agendas in the 60s was to topple Christianity. And this is stated in uh, memoirs also. Now, today, there are a third of the world popu population is Christians. So if you just look at that, uh, they didn't succeed. And Christianity not only disappeared, but uh, actually, according to the, the, the data that I saw, around a third of the world's population uh, are Christians. So what I'm trying to say is there's still a long way to go when tanks <laughs> because, but I, I was shocked also to read uh, to read that, and um, it's very disturbing. That, that that's what I have, I have to say. Yeah, and I agree, Alfred, that there is a long way to go, and uh, I have said that uh, there's resistance that I believe that they, the controllers, really didn't anticipate. Uh, I don't think that uh, they gave the number of people who are pushing back. I don't think they gave them the credit with regard to the level of resourcefulness and being resilient to push back against the NWO or the Great Reset, however you want to label it these days, because they're the same thing. And so uh, there is a battle going on right now. So I just want to make sure I make that clear, too, because I fight that battle every single day. 
I'm constantly, uh, through my activism, trying to get the word out uh, because we, we don't want, obviously, things to go down the path that the controllers are looking to take it because it's not going to be a good ending. Regardless of all the flowery words that they put behind their messages and their videos and all that stuff, uh, it's not going to be a good thing. It's going to be very brutal. I agree. So that's why everybody has to stand up. And uh, hats off for Tom for including this in the book because it's a vehicle that you normally wouldn't find something like that. That's that's my view. And the fact that he put it in the book, he slipped it in. And Billy has to agree with it because Tom just can't put anything in the book. And then somebody calls Billy up and says, hey, did you read the footnote on page 557, Bill? So he had to know it was in there. But in any case, let, let's, let's move to the next question because I... I'm taking up a lot of your time. In memoirs, it talks about the date of February 21st, 2023, which now is only about a year out. And that date was established based upon a nine-year extension that Billy said that he got to continue to play the role of Paul McCartney. Now, I did a video going back, I don't know, maybe it was about a year ago, and um, talking about this date, and I said, I don't really know what the date means. Does it mean that he just steps out, he's going to retire? Does it mean he's going to depart the world and he's not going to be here anymore? In other words, he's going to pass away. So have you guys given any thought to the fact that that date is only one year out and what you think it might mean? So Sally, let me ask you first, what do you think that that date means? I hope that the only thing I can do is hope is that's his date that he's allowed to retire. I was watching a video of him the other day, and I thought, man, he looks like he's they chewed him up and spit him out. <laughs> he has worked and, you know, just been expected to do everything that um, is required of him, and he looks like a shell of a man at this point. Yeah, he looks pretty run down when you see him in some of these uh, clips. Yep, yep. So I hope that he gets, you know, a few years of being able to just – not be subject to anybody. Um, I'm not sure if that's possible, but it would be nice to see him just live out some type of retirement without having to jump through hoops. Yeah, he's 85. He'll be 85 years old. My, my mom is uh, 87. I have no idea. People are going to say, Mike, it's adrenochrome. <laughs> you know? But, but uh, I, I can't picture my mom at all. I mean, not even I can't picture it. It's just not a reality. I mean, she could not be operating the way he is. So something's going on, right? Right. Uh, Ofer, what are your thoughts about February 21st, 2023? What do, you, what do you think that date's about? Well, I think that he will retire. By the way, we're not seeing a lot of activity uh, this year from him. I mean, last year was very, we had uh, memoirs, we had the lyrics, we had the Get Back project. So we went, we had a lot, a lot of things going on in 2021, but this year I'm not, I'm still not seeing, I don't know if he's going to tour. Um, the things we know, uh, the two dates in two, uh, this year on June 19th, there's going to be a lot of festivities around his 80th, well, Paul's 80th birthday. And there's not going to be a lot of festivities around September 9th, which is Billy's 85th birthday. So these two dates are um, upcoming this year. But I'm not seeing, I don't know if he's going to tour. I tried to check the number of tours that he did, and I found out that he did, um, this is according to Wikipedia, so I don't know, 16 solo tours so far, but there were also several tours with Wings in the 70s. So we know that he did 18 studio albums, and he's probably not, not going to put out any more albums. Well, we could be wrong. And in terms of touring, in terms of the numbers, I, I really don't know. But imagine that, touring at the age of 85. This is incredible. I don't even know how he could do it, all for his voice is shot. So I, I don't know. It could be, you know. Look, one of the things that we're seeing is that when you sign on a dotted line with the chief commander, you've got to keep pushing and pushing and pushing until the chief commander says, you don't have to do it anymore. So it's possible that, you know, he may have to go out there and, and, and tour. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's got to be grueling for a guy his age. But in any case, I think uh, Vicky stepped away. So we're going to go to the next question. I'm here. Um, oh, Vicky, I'm sorry. All right. I saw you on uh, BRB. Okay. So February 21st, 2023, what are your thoughts about that date? I, I was 
just assume when I read that that um, you know somebody seems to think Bill may be checking out that date. First of all, I want to say I don't think Bill is. I, this is morbid to say, but I think Ringo has to go first. I don't think he can leave Ringo. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that would be two Beatles go in one year. I don't know. That would make him big again. I had said at one time that I I thought he might go to the age of 90 because nine plus zero equals nine. And Billy's going to be 85 this year, which means, well, it actually doesn't mean this because I don't think I can do this for another five years. <laughs> but, uh, and the other thing I wanted to mention is Tom mentioned to Wendy that he disagrees with me on Billy's birthday of September 9th of 1937. So I don't know. I mean, I got that date based upon the fact that he does a lot of stuff on September 9th. And the song Birthday, I believe, was recorded on, finished up recording on September 18th of 1968. So September 18th, 1 plus 8 is 9. So it points to 9-9. We know a lot of things were released on September 9th of 2009 that had to do with the Beatles. So I just want to put that out there that, that maybe his birthday is not September 9th. But we shall see. Now... Last question. I have to tell you, my position is kind of changed up a little bit on this question, and, and I'll give you my answer after you guys answer. But what are your thoughts on when full disclosure might happen, or will it ever happen? And Sally, let's start with you. Well, that's a uh, question that is very difficult to answer. We're getting uh, bits and pieces of it as each book comes out. If it's full disclosure for us, are we ever going to understand everything and know everything that took place? Man, that's a, a baffling question. That's probably no. When we talk about everything, that's, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a no. Uh, no, I meant as far as, uh, uh, let's just say, uh, Billy stepping forward from a mass media perspective or even after he dies and the news coming out hey, you know what, Biological Paul died in 1966, and the guy that you thought was him wasn't him. He's Billy Shears. So what are your thoughts about from that angle? Yes, well, well, how many people will believe it even after we've been talking about it? I mean, it would be, it would be amazing to see him just uh, throw off the shackles and just uh, come right out. And, but, you know, would the media uh, cover it, whether or not it's even possible? They would have to be backing him up moving forward. Maybe, maybe that's going to happen. Maybe that's uh, part of the whole, the whole plan. They'd all have to be in lockstep. Yep. Because if they're not, then there are going to be factions that are going to look to suppress and squash the information. Vicki, what, what are your thoughts on the possibility of full disclosure? And again, we'll limit it to a mass communique that goes out and explains that Billy is not Paul. That's a, it's a difficult question because the book was some disclosure. I mean, in their mind, they can't ever say everything that happened because there have been some illegalities go on in all of this. I don't think it's ever going to fully happen, but I, I think that they may try to put that out there. I don't know if the media will report it and if people will accept it. I just don't know if people are ready because just how hard I try to convince people of this. And um, they, a lot of them, especially of certain generations, just can't handle it yet. Yeah. Well, Tom told me that uh, one of the things that they're looking to possibly do this year, possibly, is to have memoirs published through a major publisher. And that would open the aperture, obviously. It, it takes the book from being uh, kind of an underground type of read to a more mass media type of uh, publication where more people have access to it and so on. It would in all likelihood be marketed and promoted like the lyrics as an example. Anyway, so let us let me go to Ofer. Ofer, do you think full disclosure, again, within the context of it being explained that Billy's not Paul and Paul's not Billy, do you think that'll ever happen? We're seeing um, a progress in terms of the disclosure process. I mean, we started with nine years between uh, the first edition in 2009 and the, the second edition in 2018. I'm referring to memoirs, of course. And then only three years have passed 
from the second edition to the third edition, which came out in uh, 2021. So I think that the disclosure process is definitely accelerating and progressing. But uh, I have a quote from page 604. I have explained in this historical book why we, and he's referring to those in the know, could never come out in any non-fiction setting and talk about it. I can only say it in a song or in a novel such as this. So that's the quote from page uh, 604. So full disclosure, if it ever happens, will probably af uh, happen after he dies, I think. But we all need an ending and we want to see how it ends. <laughs> one way or the other. Well, I'll give you my view. Obviously, he is disclosing. So for us, we already know, right? So if you're doing the research, we already know that Billy is not Paul and Paul's not Billy. But from a uh, general public perspective, after reading the 2021 version of Memoirs and getting into the whole Osiris, Horus, the Eon of Horus, which is uh, Crowley, which aligns with the age of Aquarius and, you know, the one world government, the one world religion and all the stuff that the controllers are looking to march forward with. I thought to myself, you know what? I think disclosure from the perspective of coming out and saying that Billy's not Paul and Paul's not Billy. I think that that's way off into the future because the way I was thinking about it is if they come out and they talk about it before they have the ability to put in place their new form of spirituality, their new one world religion and all of this stuff, they run the risk of jamming up their progress because people would say, what are you talking about? So I think they're going to wait. And I say they, I'm talking about the controllers and the handlers and everybody who's behind this. I think they're going to wait until they believe they have everything boxed up. In other words, there's no turning back now. We've crossed over the threshold and the world is where we wanted it to be. And so now we can talk about it because for the people that are here, they'll get it. I don't know if I made sense. Yes. So in other words, they're going to wait until the audience is at a point where they can talk about it openly and the population that's remaining is at least in the minds of the controllers, folks. I'm not saying, by the way, I agree with this. Let me just make that perfectly clear. I'm just playing this out based upon how they're thinking things are going to go. And if I have my way, I'm going to try to screw it up as much as I can so that they don't get their way. But that's what I think they're probably thinking. Nope, we can't throw the switch on this too soon because if we do, it can get hosed up. So we're going to wait until we have a receptive audience to reveal it to. So what do you think of that, Sally? Um, I think that's probably spot on. He did, in footnotes, he mentioned that the generation after the depopulation will be literalists. Right. And that they will embrace that religion. Everything that's thrown at them, they will be a literalist and take it, take it to heart. But he also mentions that that religion will be of Paulism will be complicated and have its own set of problems. So. Right. And he said that Paulism would be the Antichrist from the standpoint that it is not Jesus. Right. That's the spin they have on it. Right. Antichrist only because it's not Jesus, not the Antichrist because of some other reasons. Yes. I thought that was interesting the way that was worded in the book, if I recall the wording properly. All right. So. Ofer and Vicky, did you, did you have anything else to add? Because we've been at it now for almost three hours, and uh, it's been a long time, but it's been a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. I wanted to thank you and Vicky and Sally. It's always good to hear other opinions, you know, on this subject, and uh, we'll see what happens. So thanks. You're very welcome, Ofer. It was great to have you on the show. Vicky, any parting words? Thank you, guys for having me once again, and uh, thank you for all your hard work. I, I know, I really understand how much work this is, and um, I don't think people who, you know, really realize that we spend our weekends and nights and all kinds of things doing this and researching, and a lot of times the rabbit hole is just empty when you get down the bottom of it. Thank you, Vicki. And Sally, what are your last words, your final words? Oh, man, I don't Not think to sound there's too such morbid. thing as final words with me. <laughs> 
but yes, um, thank you guys for um, your input. And Vicky, we have had some great conversations on the phone, uh, bouncing ideas off each other, and I can't begin to express how much that means to me. And Mike, you know my thoughts. Uh, you're just one of my favorite, all-time favorite people. Uh, you've really uh, pointed me in a lot of directions that I might, well, I might have eventually gotten there, but thank you very much for, for what you've done. Well, thank you for your kind words. Ofer and Sally and Vicky, that's going to wrap the show up. Really, I had a great time hosting the show, and again, it is great to get different perspectives, uh, and you guys have done a lot of work and a lot of research in this area, so I want to thank you personally for, you know, for being part of the team that, you know, we're able to bounce things off of each other and see if we can try to make some more headway. So thanks, everyone, and uh, I'll have the show out as soon as I can.